Right, I am Christine Taylor and I am 76, which some people can't believe, but <laughs> anyway, it came to when I was wanted to leave school or when I had to leave school, I needed a roof over my head. So I thought, I oh, know, I'll join the Wrens, the Women's Royal Naval Service. Got a roof over my head, did went to Burfield near Reading for the initial training. That doesn't exist now. Well, Burfield exists, but it's now some CND base. <laughs> anyway, after this, during that six weeks, I got appendicitis. <laughs> and I thought, well, this is a good start. They'll chuck me out now. And I was in the sick bay to begin with. I mean, appendicitis these days, you're probably in the hospital out the next day. But I had to go somewhere to convalesce. And I thought, wow, they're not going to keep me on in the wrens. But I was given a sick notice to hand in, but I, I ripped it up. <laughs> so I went back to Burfield, started doing all the sport, cross-country, Halfway over one jump, I thought, blood. <laughs> Where they'd done the operation, I'd split the stitches. <laughs> I'll tell you, I, I've been there, I've done it. So I kept that to myself, and then I couldn't hide it anymore because it was beginning to hurt. Back into sick bay for a few weeks, and I thought, they're not going to keep me on now. They said, who did this operation? They should have given you a letter to excuse you from any sort of activity like that. And I ripped it up. <laughs> I'll tell you, I was a bit of a so-and-so, really. So then during that six weeks at Burford, you had to decide which branch of the range you went into, like office work or... Um, Meteorology, I'd have loved that actually. Um, loads of things. And I saw air mechanic and I thought that would be different. So off I was carted to Scotland to do my training to begin, become an air mechanic. <laughs> Airframes and engines, you got filthy all day long. And I've worn hearing aids for quite a while. And although we had ear defenders when the aircraft were landing and taking off, I don't think they were as efficient as they are now. So it probably led to me going a bit deaf before I should have done. Well, I, I loved it up there and it was great. We were climbing hills at the weekend and just having a good time the rest of the time when we weren't working. And we did nights as well. We did eight hours at night. And it was really good. There was a lot of comradeship. Um, I won't go into some of the fun. <laughs> and, and then I thought, oh, I'm having a good time here. And they posted me to Yeovilton near Somerset. Ever heard of it? A little village about 10 miles out of Yeovil. Lovely it was. And stayed there for two or three years. And I thought, can't do this for the rest of my life, really, because I absolutely love sport. All my life I love sport. And if you like sport, in any of the services, you're made. You can enter this, that and the other against the other, you know, the Army and the Air Force. And I thought, this is, you know, very good, but I can't do this forever. Perhaps I'd better get a proper job. <laughs> and I, in, in those days, I don't know if they still do it, but in the services, they used to give you three free travel warrants a year to go from wherever you were to where we wanted to go. So I was a bit cheeky, because by this time, I decided to join the police. And I don't know if Leslie, who you've just been seeing, knows that I used to be in the police. Anyway, I came to Winchester to take the entrance exam for the police. And I was at the headquarters going through all these questions, and some superintendent came up behind me, and he said, don't you know that one? No. Nope. It was what were the initials EFTA? Any, anyone? No? It, so he, 
I mean, there was all these people that he said, European Treatment Fee Trade Association, so I put it in. And to this day, I think it was probably that that got me in, because probably nobody else knew it. And I met him later, Superintendent Harris. He was absolutely lovely. And to my amazement, I passed and got moved. Where did I go to, first of all? Oh, yes, I went to Aldershot. And everyone used to say to me, oh, no, you haven't got Aldershot, have you? Nobody liked Aldershot for some reason. But perhaps having a bit of a life in the services, you know, I didn't mind whether it was Aldershot or anywhere. And initially, we were told, you'll only go to your first station for two years and you're on probation. I thought, well, that's a good start to my police life. <laughs> Two years on probation. And I was under instruction from, oh, he was a lovely man. He became a sergeant eventually, but he was, he was so good. And he had, he used to go out on the beat, and for a while he showed me around. And then he said, right, now, I'm going to go this way, you're going to go that way, and we'll meet up at a certain time, because we didn't have these walkie-talkies or anything like that. So I said, OK. And I went round these streets, and I went, went round some back street, and there were two cars. And you couldn't pass on in that road, in this, in this street. And these cars were parked half on the pavement, and all the other cars couldn't get through. So I booked them both. <laughs> when I got back, met up with Colin Stoddart, he said to me, anything exciting happened? I said, well, no, not really. Um, booked two cars in Cross Street. He said, did you? Good for you. Did you speak to the people? I said, no, because I couldn't find them. I just left a note. And a few weeks later, I get called into the superintendent's office and he said, I'm looking at these two cars that you booked. I said, yes. I said, they were causing a great, you know, disturbance. I said, people couldn't get through. I said, they shouldn't have been half on the pavement and half on the road. He said, no. Have you any objection if I just caution them? And I sat there and I thought, something wrong here. I said, why? He said, well, have you any objection? I said, in a way, I haven't got any objection as long as you caution both. I didn't want one caution and not the other. Well, I was a bit cross because he cautioned one and took the other one to court. And the one he cautioned <laughs> was a friend of his who ran the jewellers. <laughs> and I got really cross about this because I thought, well, that's not on. That's not fair. You've either got to caution both or you've got to book both. Anyway, I thought, I've caused enough trouble up until then, so I just thought, oh, blow it. And I was still doing a lot of sport. And over the years, I got bad back, and I thought, oh, I have to give up some of the sport. It got so bad, I couldn't walk very well, really. So I had to have some time off. And then I thought, oh, this isn't going to go down well. If you can't walk, you can't walk the streets. So what they did was, for a while, they took me off the streets and put me in the office, in one of the offices. Well, that didn't do me any favours because sitting down all day wasn't good. But there was one particular day I was in the inquiry office and this lady came in on a regular basis on a Monday. And... In those days, you didn't have a grid, a, gr a grill across the, you know, inquiry place. And she used to come in, go, I said, the form you want is right at the bottom and I can't get it. So she'd jump over the counter and come and get it. We'd fill it out, she'd sign it. And it was only um, a license to move um, animals from one area to another. Yeah, I don't know. I suppose it's in case any disease gets passed on. So every Monday I used to look forward to her coming straight in over the counter and <laughs> did the form. 
And then I did go back on the streets for a while and I got involved in a fight, <laughs> as you do. And we worked shifts then the whole time, even the ladies, we joined the men, which didn't bother me. And I got involved in this fight somewhere. I know which part of Winchester it is, but I won't say. And I'm going round, driving round the back streets, and I could hear this terrible commotion going on. So I drive round there, and I had a police cadet with me. Well, they're not allowed to work after two o'clock in the morning. I don't know why. I don't know if it's still the same. So <laughs> we go round, and what had happened was a lady had come home and found her husband in bed with another woman <laughs> and there was this almighty scene and middle of the night between one and two and all the lights and all the houses were going on <laughs> and all looking out so the woman I said you've got to lower your voice and stop that language no I won't not for anybody I said well if you don't I shall arrest you and she started to run off and I <laughs> I grabbed her, or tried to, <laughs> and I, she went through some hedge and I ended up with a shoe. <laughs> so, oh, I mean, it's unbelievable some of the things that happened. So we get back to the, eventually we caught up with her, got her back to the police station and she got charged with breach of the peace. <laughs> and then a bit later, for ages, down North Walls is a park and during the summer, a lot of people used to um, camp out in tents. And we kept getting reports of a man was entering people's tents at night, in the middle of the night, any, any time during the night, and chatting them up and trying to get them out of the tent, but we could never catch him. This particular night, we get a call to go to the campsite. We go. And I see him, I actually saw him, and he was running off. So I ran after, I got him. And we weren't allowed to search a man too much, you know, we could only do his outside clothing. So I told him I was arresting him. The CID weren't very pleased because they'd been after him for ages. And I thought, oh, I got him. <laughs> Get him back there, back to the police station. They took him in the um, custody area and one of the policemen came out to me and he said you don't know how lucky you were I said why because they searched him thoroughly then he got this knife on him about that long <laughs> so I thought oh well another near miss Oh, that, that's, a, that's a difficult one because life seems to have changed in general for lots of, you know, for lots of reasons. And yet it is sad because they've got more opportunity these days than a lot of people used to have. And I don't know, it makes you wonder where it's going to go. I'm, all I'll say is I'm glad I was brought up and, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> well, during the years that I was brought up and worked and didn't have any of this, and I used to play sport. Why can't they play sport instead of doing some of the stupid things? I've played at Wimbledon, tennis, court 23. <laughs> well, you see, every year we um, the services used to play against each other. And one day I got a phone call from Sue Tyson, and she was a, um, an officer. And I thought, what's she bringing me for? And she said, are you up to a game of tennis, doubles? I just thought it was going to be local, you see. I said, yes. And she said, it's at Wimbledon. I said, pardon? <laughs> <laughs> so we went. We got thoroughly beaten, but the whole experience was wonderful. You know, it was a beautiful summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why can't people put some of their energy into sports, though? But then I'm a bit biased because I actually...